welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Um, thank you for taking the time to come along. And I hope that this will be a useful session for you all with some tangible takeaways. Um, so my name's Laura Thacker. I'm Joint Head of Programme for Bristol Ageing Better, also known as BAB. Um, and BAB is part of the National Ageing Better family. And over the last five and a half years, we've worked with partners across Bristol, um, trialling different ways of reducing isolation and loneliness in people over 50. We're now at a point in our journey where we're sharing the learning and evaluation from the programme um, to help inform future service delivery, both locally and nationally. Um, as you can imagine, we have a bank of knowledge from all of the pre-COVID face-to-face projects, um, but today we wanted to bring partners together to share learning about working remotely with older people, whether that's over the phone or online. So some of the partners speaking today are part of the Support Hub in Bristol, which was set up in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and this is a collective of local organisations working together um, with older people to support them with their practical, emotional and social needs. Um, as you can imagine, this has changed over the, the, the last few months um, as uh, the situation has changed with COVID. Um, but today we'll be focusing on the social aspect. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree that there have been some real positives to working remotely. Um, and the same can be said for holding group activities online or via phone, um, where certain participation barriers are removed, um, particularly for those with low mobility or those who find it difficult to leave the home for other reasons. Um, but there are clear obstacles to this newer way of working and um, we're going to start off today's session by looking at some of these barriers and how to overcome them. So just looking at the structure for today, um, during the presentation um, our partners will be covering the barriers to participation, we'll be looking at tips for facilitation, um, feedback and evaluation, co-design, privacy considerations and also accessibility. Um, we will be keeping everyone on mute during the presentation, but then there'll be an opportunity at the end for questions. Um, so please feel free to use the chat box to ask questions throughout um, and we'll return to those afterwards um, to answer them. We also have live captions or subtitles today um, and to turn these on and off you need to use the CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen. Also just to let you know that this event is being recorded um, and that's just so that we can share it with you all afterwards. Um, so without further ado I would like to introduce our speakers today. Um, so first off, um, Joe, would you like to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jo Stokes and I work with AGK Bristol as the Community Services Manager and I head up um, Linkage within AGK Bristol. Are you okay for me to just keep going, Laura, or did you need to introduce anything else? Um, I was just going to introduce them, all of the speakers first. Okay, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Um, and next we've got Michael. Did you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Hello everyone. <clears throat> My name is Michael Pryor and I work for The Reader. We're a UK-wide charity uh, organising shared reading groups all over the country. Um, and I look after the groups and the team of volunteers that deliver that in Bristol. Thank you, Michael. Um, and Isabel, did you want to unmute yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Isabel Jones. I'm the CEO of the charity Alive. We are a charity based predominantly in Bristol and we work with older people in care homes and at home. And our um, main area is to improve the quality of life through activity and engagement. And we also offer training for care staff and for um, carers at home. Brilliant, thank you, Isabel. And then we've also got Emma as well. Did you want to unmute yourself? Hi there, yep, my name's Emma Dyer. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Alive Activities. So I do a lot of work with uh, the projects team and a lot of the innovation type stuff that we were looking at. Lovely, thank you. And then we have two people from the Alzheimer's Society. And um, so Sophia, did you want to introduce yourself? 
Hello, I'm Sophia Simla. I work for Alzheimer's Society as a group coordinator. Um, I focus on a service called Singing for the Brain. Thank you. And then we've also got Pete. Hello, I'm Pete Conway. I'm also a group coordinator with Alzheimer's Society and I mainly focus on our activity groups and memory cafes in Bristol. Brilliant, thank you. And then last but not least, we have Harriet. Did you want to unmute yourself? Hello, um, my name is Harriet Lupton and I'm from Hearing Impaired Support Scheme in Bristol. So we go to people's houses to service their hearing aids, NHS hearing aids, when they're too disabled to get to the outpatients clinic and they might need servicing or care between six and 12 monthly to try to keep people in touch with life. Brilliant, thank you very much. So over to Joe to kick off today's session. Great, thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm Joe, Community Service Manager from Age UK Bristol and um, what I'm starting talking about is participation barriers to online groups. So Age UK Bristol, we have, um, we've started a weekly Art on Zoom group, um, which oh, uses, oh. obviously uses Zoom. And also um, we've had an occasional group which meets to do the SS Great Britain virtual tours. So despite eliminating some barriers that I think probably we can all think of, we have found that delivering sessions in general online pose their own issues. So the first one, you know, technology gives us great opportunities, but it also poses its own barriers. So for someone to own a suitable device, um, there's a financial barrier to purchasing hardware, obviously. Um, but also once you've got that device, actually having an internet connection um, can be a barrier. And I think it goes wider than just the financial uh, burden of having an internet connection. It's also if you've never been in, it, had a life where you've had um, internet, uh, broadband, Wi-Fi, then actually starting that process, especially for older people, can you can feel quite unconfident, I think, and be afraid of um, scams. So I think there is a need there for support to um, know how to find a good contract, what's a reasonable price, um, and have trust in companies. There's also knowledge around knowing how to access the online program that people use, like Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And I know certainly for our um, art on Zoom classes, one of the great outcomes of it has been that several people started as, as newbies to Zoom, but now they're quite proficient in it. And obviously that can be taken across to other areas of their lives. But we also have a, a minority that, that constantly struggles with Zoom and does need one-to-one -one support. So, so there is something there about training. And one of the ways we've tackled that is we've recently recruited a volunteer who actually works in IT support themselves. Um, and they are supporting attendees specifically who are struggling to access the art on Zoom sessions. Um, enough barrier is around access to enough space and other equipment at home. So for instance, if you're doing an online group around exercise, uh, you do actually need enough room to move around in. And um, I speak from personal experience, but I have to shove my coffee table out of the room every time I want to do an, an online class, which is very heavy. Um, and other things like art equipment for our online art Zooms. Um, actually, it's not the easiest thing at the moment to go out to a shop to buy paints or, or colouring pencils. Um, you know, the shops are really restricted in what are open. So it's about taking those things into consideration as much as mobility getting to the shops. And I think there's also something around health conditions that can prevent or discourage someone from joining. Um, so I'm thinking about things like dementia um, or other cognitive impairment, sensory impairments. Um, so in, for instance, people living with dementia um, or memory loss might find it difficult to understand how to interact with the screen. I think we've all grown up with 
um, or we've all been introduced to recently, the kind of language that goes with the screens, so the buttons that are repeated across several different platforms that we recognise. But for older population, and especially someone with a cognitive impairment, they might not have that knowledge. And um, obviously, if you're living with a sensory impairment, um, it could be hard to lip read or to know who's talking because everybody's on a small screen or might be, um, they might have their camera turned off. And then finally, obviously, lag of software and internet connection. I mean, it's frustrating enough for the rest of us who are allegedly proficient using our laptops and video conferencing. But I think um, for someone who's not feeling confident or they have memory lapse, then that, that's going to be um, quite a significant barrier. Right, and I'm going to hand over as well to Michael from The Reader, who's also got some um, thoughts to, to offer us. Thanks, Jo. Um, yes, uh, we're aware that there's uh, another group of people who may <clears throat> be able to um, join an online group, but actually have no desire to do so. <clears throat> they don't want to use the technology. And in the case of shared reading, I think, which a lot of people have associated with uh, an intimate, personal, social experience, but they have no desire to do shared reading if it can't be in exactly that setting. And alongside that, I think there were quite a few people who, again, could have joined, but actually felt, oh, this is, um, this is back in March. Oh, this is just a temporary measure. Uh, we won't get involved because we'll be back to normal in a few weeks' time. Some of those people, of course, have rejoined months later. Some, are, some we're still to make contact with, um, are, even after these many, many months. Um, there's a, there's a lot around um, online groups and confidence as well. And Joe's touched on some of those issues to do with uh, using or relating or feel, feeling comfortable with the technology, but also for anyone who um, feels anxious about joining a new group of people, already feels isolated or lonely, or perhaps is quite shy, um, joining any kind of group can be a barrier. And sometimes there, there may be increased um, issues with that, with using technology. Uh, the opposite is also true, that some people have found it easier to, easier to join an online group, um, uh, even though normally they wouldn't want to go to a face-to-face -face group. But in terms of barriers, it's important to remember that sometimes that can be around confidence as well. Um, memory is an issue as well, and for those people who don't have a care or, or some system of reminding them that they've got a weekly um, shared reading group, for example, that um, they can often forget or it not um, occur to them that the reading group meets at a certain time, um, and that's, uh, that's obviously can be a barrier for some people as well. Hi there, so uh, my name is Emma. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about participation barriers for groups uh, using teleconferencing and uh, meeting on the telephone. Um, while running teleconferencing groups does go a long way to reducing a lot of the barriers that were discussed in the previous slide, it does have its own issues. Um, mostly with accessing the call. So uh, we touched on memory in the previous slide. That is obviously uh, an issue here as well, remembering to be on the call. Um, the added bonus of teleconferencing is that you are able as a facilitator to call somebody's telephone um, and make that ring and, and they are able to pick up. Um, there are barriers there with some of the software. Uh, quite often it is a, it's not a local number. Uh, it's an automated message. Uh, it's often American um, and all the people are told again and again and again to watch out for scams and people that aren't familiar. So um, quite often people will become confused and hang up. Um, so there's some work needs to be done there to update the software and how that works. Um, similarly, you're able to dial into the teleconferencing, um, someone or someone you, you live with, um, and there are issues there with the software that's used around uh, needing a phone number, needing a meeting code, um, sometimes up to three different sets of numbers to log in. And again, um, talking through to a, an American voice and an automated message system. So people quite often become confused. Um, 
Also, there's an issue with fine motor skills, being able to hold the phone, being able to press that many numbers, and also being able to have the strength to press those buttons. So there's also some work around voice technology that we, we need to be looking at in order to, to get people to log on easily or reducing the number of button presses that we need. Um, we also need to look at things like the location of the telephone in the house. Um, it might take somebody longer to get across the house to answer the phone than it does, uh, than the phone will ring for. Um, it might be that they're not able to hold the phone for the length of the conversation that we're having. So all of these things do need looking at. The one thing that we came across uh, is that actually everybody does have a telephone. Pretty much everybody has a telephone. Um, and this means that out of all of the technology in their homes, that is the one thing that is most likely to be um, adapted to the person's specific needs, whether that's hearing or lights flashing, or they have a mobile that tells them when they need to get to the, mo the, the phone that they can actually hear. So that's usually quite good. Um, and that's the bonus of running teleconferencing. Um, the other issue we have is cost. So unlike anything else that you pay up front with the telephone, actually, if you're signing into something that's going to charge you, you receive the bill later. So we need to look at how we're clear if you're running a session or we're running a session that we're clear on how much it costs, who's going to take that cost on, um, and that no one gets any unexpected um, surprises in their bill at the end of the month. Um, and then finally, obviously, uh, hearing barriers. Um, there are a number of different ways people deal with that on the telephone themselves. And as I mentioned, would normally have the telephone um, adapted already. So it's, well, it's such a great way to be using this way to, to, to engage with people. Um, the one of the barriers really is that online and telephone groups can become quite chaotic or turn into just a lecture from the facilitator if they're not very well facilitated. Um, so I'm going to hand on to uh, some people that are going to chat to us about tips for facilitation. Uh, yes, a few tips for facilitation of online groups now. Um, one thing that we found really important is allowing for social interaction, particularly some settling in time at the beginning of a session. Interestingly, with um, regular um, shared reading groups before the pandemic. Um, we always encouraged our volunteers to get very quickly into the activity to get into the reading activity rather than for it to become too much of a, um, an informal social activity at the beginning. But um, we're, we're doing the opposite um, at the moment for online groups where we encourage people to, um, to have that interaction we find that that makes for a better session but also in in these times um, weekly sessions with people um, getting together are serving more than the function in our case of shared reading but they're also about people checking in on health and well-being and, and other issues and so that settling in time at the beginning of a session is serving a number of important functions at the moment um, interaction throughout the session is really important um, and I think that happens for all of the activities that we're highlighting today but particularly for shared reading interaction between people not just the facilitator and individuals but between all of the members of that group is really important to encourage um, and importantly um, the lighting and sound for the facilitator so the person who is leading that session online is really important that they are clear visually and clearly audible as well. I'll now hand on to either Emma or Isabel. It's me. <laughs> it's <laughs> my turn now. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, Alive have been running um, a variety of online groups. We've been running physical activity groups um, and also groups in care homes as well. So we've had two different audiences. Um, of delivering online. We've had people at home who are zooming in, but then also to care homes, we've been zooming into them, but then having six or eight people actually in one room. So it's been quite an interesting way of um, working out what works best. What we have found is that we need to make sure that the individuals in that group, that we are aware of all their needs. Um, and that might be, we need to know if people are living with dementia, we need to know what their physical abilities are, 
And so it's really important to make sure that we have that awareness because you will need to adapt the content um, and also the way that you're delivering your group to ensure that everyone's needs are met um, and included. And to be aware that these needs might change. So actually, if you're running with a group of people that you may have started with you know, six weeks ago, we need to keep checking in to make sure um, that what we're delivering um, is very relevant. Within a care home, what we have found is um, actually Previously, at the beginning, we'd have a laptop or an iPad plugged in with an HDMI cable through to a TV. Um, what we found more towards the end of the, um, over the last few months is actually having someone in that room that can share the iPad with the individuals that we can still cast onto the TV or even with a long connector. It really helps that we can engage with people, especially people living with dementia um, on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and we can have that individual interaction within a group setting. It's also important to keep variety, um, to actually keep those sessions moving, um, to have, because people's concentration will go, again, um, depending on people's needs. Um, but it's important to keep, to keep it moving and to keep variety. But also, to keep it simple, um, especially when you're doing physical activity. And especially on Zoom, it's not always easy to see. If there's a small person you know, in a screen, you can't always quite see what they're doing. So actually, that simplicity is really important so people can follow, can understand, not become confused and actually really enjoy what they're doing. So I'm gonna hand on to Sophia now. Hello, thank you, Sophia here. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, I focus on a service called Singing for the Brain. So I thought it'd be useful to share some singing specific facilitation skills. Um, so you might have um, noticed on Zoom that with everybody unmuted, it's a bit chaotic if people are trying to talk over each other, there's time delays. So when running a singing activity, um, unfortunately, having everybody's microphones on just doesn't make a sound that you want to hear really. <laughs> so um, how we've been running things is that we have one singing leader and one voice that everybody can hear and sing along with. Um, so everybody else is on mute except for the one singing leader. We also make use of the screen sharing facility to share lyrics up on the screen. So just making sure that they are a good size font. Um, I usually use PowerPoint to share my screen with so that there's no, no kind of other distractions on the screen um, so that they're really easy to, to follow. Um, you can also share videos on Zoom um, using the shared screen feature. Um, it's important that when you're sharing a video, you also click the button that says uh, share computer sound. Um, so that comes up when you first click the shared screen button or it's in the little drop down at the top of the screen. And this means that um, whatever you're listening to on your computer, everybody else in the Zoom can hear as well. It's important to note that if you have someone singing along with that, um, it needs to be the same person as the person that's sharing the audio otherwise the time delay won't mix up um, i'm not a expert on copyright either but it's definitely worth noting that if you're using someone else's music you need to be aware of what what your rights are and what you should be doing with um public use of music um, musical accompaniment if somebody is singing along with a musical instrument uh, so Zoom has a feature where if there's something in the background, it tries to uh, dim it, it tries to stop the sound. Um, and sometimes Zoom thinks that musical instruments are background noise. So um, if you're using an instrument to sing along with, you need to go into your audio settings and turn on the original sound. Um, so that means that when you're playing along with something that it Zoom doesn't change the sound, it just comes out as it's being heard. Um, lastly, something that I've worked out recently is that um, with certain levels of Zoom accounts, you also get a telephone number so that people can dial in and just listen to the audio. Um, for some of the people who are supporting, um, as previously mentioned, it's just not possible for some people to dial out themselves on a telephone. Um, so using a smartphone, um, I can call into the Zoom myself and use the conference call feature on my smartphone to call them. So um, it puts the first call on hold and then you press add call. 
and then you call the person that you want to join the session and then you press merge and the two should be able to hear each other. Um, it's important to say that you will need to turn the sound off one of your devices if you're also joining by a laptop, otherwise you'll get feedback loop. Um, and I think that's all I've got to say on that. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Peter. Hello, um, I'm Pete. Um, I just like to share our experiences on using Zoom for larger groups. Um, our use has been around activity groups and memory cafes. And what I'd really like to say is using Zoom as the tool you need it to be. As we were saying earlier, variance in activities is really important to keep people engaged and recognising that everybody has different interests and preferences and actually by offering a variety of different uh, themes and ways of facilitating um, you're more likely to engage people um, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, if you're looking for things like uh, peer support or social time, uh, utilising things like the breakout rooms where people can actually spend time in smaller groups to have more engagement is really important. If you are doing an activity that has got a single focus, um, so that could be, as we said earlier, about sharing your screen uh, to either use a PowerPoint or perhaps a bit of video, um, then you'll be making sure that that is the view which people are seeing. Um, at the Memory Cafe, we also have speakers come along uh, to give people information and also subjects of interest. Um, we would be uh, using the spotlight feature on Zoom to make sure that the uh, group's attention is on that individual during that, that section which does make it easier for people to engage with the speaker. Um, recently there have been some updates where you can actually um, share a spotlight so if a participant asks a question you can actually spotlight both the speaker and the person asking the question at once and again that's all about minimizing the amount of distractions and trying to draw the focus to what the activity is. Um, as an extension to that, there is going to be quite a bit going on if you are hosting a Zoom session, if it's not something you've done much of before. Um, you are going to be wanting to do things like keeping an eye on your participants list to see if you've got people potentially joining or leaving the session. If you've got background noise happening in the group, you may need to uh, mute an individual to avoid that distracting from the session. So um, to help with that, what I personally do is I work with two screens when I'm running a Zoom session. And that means I can try and keep an eye on um, the participants in one screen and any boxes I've got to my left hand side so I'm keeping an eye on the participants list and I'm also we're using breakout rooms I've got a list of breakout rooms there additionally you may have some browsers open or powerpoints open that you want to share so it can get quite quite crowded on a single screen on occasion I have even gone to three screens but that does feel a bit of a stretch um, Another thing which is helpful if you are able to is actually have a co-host with you as well, uh, particularly if you are leading the facilitation of a group. That means that you will be able to concentrate on facilitating and your co-host can assist you by keeping an eye on the participants, muting if needed, possibly renaming, which we will touch on later. Um, okay, I will aware of shortened time, so I'll, I'll pass back over to Isabel. Thanks, Pete. I'm going to be talking now about facilitation um, with the groups um, on the phone and we're moving away from online. As you can imagine, um, being on the phone um, is very different um, to actually facilitating groups online. The difference is predominantly is you don't have any of the visual cues. You're always on the phone and potentially we've had groups where we've had up to 15 people um, on the phone, which can get quite chaotic. Um, the most important thing at the beginning um, is to ask people to say their name for a number of reasons. It's important to actually get people to talk to begin with because some people don't feel particularly confident and actually being able to do that, it kind of breaks that barrier down. Um, and it's important for people to listen 
to each other and to be able to learn. Um, and that's something that you have to, we found with our groups that we constantly have to do is actually reminding people to listen to each other. But also it's incredible to hear and realize how people learn how to listen to each other. Right at the beginning when we started these groups, um, people would be talking all over each other. Um, groups wouldn't kind of be listening to each other, but actually as the weeks progressed, people got calmer, people were able to pause and were actually learning new skills. Um, and it's been fantastic to see how they have developed. So if you are starting off a new group, don't be worried if that first session is chaotic um, because it will get better. Um, and actually we just started a new group two weeks ago um, and we had talks straight afterwards and one of the ladies was saying, well, I'm not quite sure if it's for me. We said, give it another week and people will calm down and they did and they're loving it. So it is just a trial and error um, and just listen. It's also important to really share that time equally between people and understand who really wants to share, who's very keen to share, but allowing time and asking people questions. Um, and that's really important to have those questions that you know, you have a list of people involved um, and then you can, you can pinpoint um, who you actually want to be able to get to talk. But also equally, don't be afraid of silence. And I think that's something we often forget and we get frightened of, especially when there isn't the visual cues. And it's okay to listen and to have silence within a conversation. One thing we would really recommend is actually within that first call and possibly the second is to have something called a getting to know you session. So those questions are all about finding out what people's interests are, finding out um, what their personalities are. It enables you then to really be able to, fund, to be able to plan for the future, to plan those next sessions. If we know what people's abilities are, what their needs are and what their interests are, we can ensure then that we have a range of sessions going forward that are really applicable to people. But it's also important to keep, to keep changing that and to keep listening to people because you may find you have new people joining and the topics that you chose six weeks ago are not necessarily um, applicable um, or need to be developed um, going forward. I'll go on to the next slide now, actually, if that's all right. Um, talking about feedback um, and evaluation. This is a very important part, actually, of how we've evolved um, all our groups. Um, during each session, um, it's so it, it's incredibly important to find out what people's opinions are through discussion, whether or not from what you found out, whether or not you need to alter your plans and whether you need to amend them going forward. As I said, um, you know, direct questioning is needed. Um, it's important to actually ask people what they really think and what they really feel. Um, sometimes I think on Zoom, it's quite difficult to read body language. And of course, on the phone, you don't get the body cues. So that's why that direct questioning is really important. But another stage of evaluation that's really important is actually ensuring that we're, we're talking to the members outside the group, because some people feel more confident in actually responding to that kind of questioning when they're not surrounded by other people. So between Alive um, and Linkage, we developed some simple questions. Um, we wanted to find out if people were really enjoying the groups what they wanted, if they helped them during lockdown, what would they like in the future? And the groups involved in the support hub, we interviewed each other's attendees. So actually we would find out what they wanted and it was from someone who was actually um, a bit more neutral. Um, we obviously ensured their consent and that was in incredibly important that we got that before we actually phoned them up. Um, but actually it really helped to discover what the satisfaction and what people wanted to do. Um, and I remember I was um, interviewing some of the um, two members of the reader and one of them, she said she, she had mobility issues and actually she was um, sort of stuck at home to a certain extent. But she said that one hour a week, it's felt like she's been going out. And that was so important to have that kind of feedback from people. Um, another person who was part of the Age UK said, whoever thought of this deserves a pat on the back. Um, so for us, we were able to develop our practice as a result of this evaluation, but also to realise how important this had been and what a difference it had made to the people that we'd been able to reach. So I'll hand it over to the next slide. Hi there, Emma again. So um, as well as the feedback from the sessions we've been running, we've also been doing uh, a large co-design exercise. 
Uh, during October uh, this year, we were lucky enough to receive funding from the National Lottery to spend a month understanding what older people wanted from engagement in their own homes. Um, we went quite broad. Uh, we were looking at all technology in older people's homes and all uh, ways they would like to be engaged in activity while they were um, home during lockdown. Um, we, we wanted to understand what technology was in their homes, what they were comfortable with using, what they have been doing since lockdown and what sort of activities they enjoyed. We worked with four main groups and we conducted eight really quite in-depth user interviews um, with people from each group. So we looked at uh, older people, um, just to say most of those were sort of over 65, 70, so the, the older end of older people rather than um, over 50s, which I know quite a lot of people here work with. Um, and we looked specifically at those living with dementia or sensory impairments and physical impairments as well. We chatted to informal carers of older people, so those loved ones and friends living living with them or living away from them, because there's obviously very different issues there. Um, we work with Home Instead to understand uh, what formal carers could do to support activity of older people in their own homes. Um, and we worked with care coordinators as well as, well as frontline caregivers there. Um, and we spoke to people that were running um, support groups, um, specifically the Happy Days Memory Cafe and the Monday Club. Um, and that was very interesting to hear things from their side. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of what we learned. Um, so everybody that we spoke to had access to a phone and a television. That was the universal constant. Um, users that did have access to other things usually had a tablet or a desktop computer. Very few people had a smartphone and very few people used a laptop. Um, when people were using technology, it had usually been set up by a loved one or someone close to them who was a bit more um, able with this sort of thing. Um, when they were using it, they were using YouTube mostly, uh, eBay, email, um, and the internet. And Zoom was the most popular of the uh, video calling software. Uh, mostly they've been set up by other people um, and they were comfortable mostly just clicking on a link and opening it. Not many people were up comfortable setting up their own uh, meetings. Um, what came out of that really was that teleconferencing for everybody that we spoke to was the most popular way um, of, of, of chatting, chatting to other people rather than receiving activity, but chatting and staying in touch with people they'd been in touch with beforehand. Um, they said that it was enough for them to just hear people and chat to people. Um, but the people that did use video calling were, were really, um, really passionate about it. And so if there's some way of using a mix of the two, it would be useful. Um, so what we'll be doing over January and February, uh, Alive will be working for another two months. We've been given another two months of funding to work with the rest of the support hub to understand how we can develop, uh, a teleconferencing system that is easier to access for people um, and for everybody to use. So um, if anybody's got any input they would like uh, to get in touch with us for, please do. Um, and we'd like to include uh, your users and your inputs and thoughts on the work that we'll be doing to produce a system that's easy for everybody to use. Um, thanks. Hello, Sophia speaking again. So, um, going to talk a little bit about some privacy considerations. Uh, just a disclaimer that Pete and myself are going to be talking about this. We're not experts on GDPR, um, so make sure that you're doing your own research on, on what you can and can't do legally. Um, but just a few things that we've come across. So um, when you log into Zoom, sometimes it can display your name as your email address, your phone number, your first and last name. Um, so some people joining might not be aware that that's the case. So um, often we have the co-host who's designated to change people's names to their first name just to protect that data, make sure people are recognisable by their names and it just makes the whole um, experience a little bit more friendly as well rather than talking to a, a number on the screen. Um, we sometimes have people in care homes who um, have their iPad device connected to a television so that we appear on the television as a picture um, so just to be aware that some people might not 
necessarily realise that they're being filmed if this is the case, that they're not just watching a TV programme, that they are on a two-way uh, camera. Um, so one way to get around this is just to make sure that you're engaging with them throughout. So waving, saying hello by name, um, and just making sure that they consent to being on camera and that they're aware that they're on camera throughout, especially if somebody has cognitive issues um, and might forget halfway through. It's really important to make sure they're aware all the way through. Um, similarly, if somebody falls asleep during a session, I would recommend turning their video off um, just because they it is their uh, privacy, isn't it? If they fall asleep, they might not realise that they're still on camera. Um, and just another note on that, if somebody walks out of the room and has a conversation that the microphone's picking up and they don't realise, just to turn their microphone off so that if somebody's having a conversation, they don't know that everybody else can hear, just to make sure that you're respecting their privacy as well by turning their mic off. And I think I'm over to Pete now. Thank you. Hello again. Right. So one of the things we try to do probably quite early in the group is to have a conversation with the group members or participants about um, some kind of guidelines for the group, um, much the same as we may do in a face-to-face -face group, but being aware that using online groups is a different platform. Um, we want to make sure that people feel comfortable and able to share things if they wish to. Um, so just having a bit of a conversation about confidentiality within the group, we tend to find is quite helpful. Um, you may also need to, depending on your um, organisation, um, we tend to mention, obviously we keep everything confidential within the group, but if there was ever a concern that anybody uh, may be at risk of harm, then we would um, have a duty of care to pass that on, just so people are aware they're within kind of a group setting and that safeguarding uh, policy is, is in there. Um, also, um, other things which could be a risk are people recording a session um, and passing that recording on. So again, we'd ask that people kind of don't record the session or with a Zoom invite, it's actually quite easy just to forward that group invitation to other people. And again, that is a conversation we'd have. Um, just ask if anyone else was interested in joining the group. Um, you know, we're happy to have that conversation with them, but please don't just kind of distribute the joining details, just so you've got a little bit of a steer of kind of who's within your group as well. Um, and that again goes back to keeping an eye on the participants list as people are joining and leaving, just so you, it may be helpful to be aware of who is in your group at any one time. Um, also thinking about how you're distributing um, personal information so really it's going to be email addresses when you are inviting people to a group if you're doing it through an email um, we always try and use the BCC blind carbon copy box rather than the two box uh, for the email invites because then it ensures that everybody's email addresses isn't visible to everybody else's. If you are using a um, Outlook invitation, um, meeting invitation, then there is the option of listing people as a under the resources, which doesn't sound very nice, but it basically means um, their name may be visible, but their email address won't key, which is key, won't be visible to others. So that is a consideration you may want to think about um, again going back to speakers that come into the group some people do um, want to gather some personal information about people sometimes and it's just planning that session so it's having that conversation before the group in case people do need perhaps I don't know postcodes or dates of birth or something like that or passing information on then we tend to kind of do that and be a bit of a um, gatekeeper to kind of pass information backwards and forwards rather than people sharing too much within the group if it's not a fully private setting. Okay, um, I will pass over to uh, Harriet. Hello. Um, just to give you a second to read the slide. I'm hard of hearing myself and I've learned quite a few things 
on doing Zoom and I haven't done teleconferencing myself. Hard of hearing people rely on good visuals and your efforts to help them make sense of what is being said. It's not just the hearing, it's a sense difficulty, making sense. So lip reading is naturally enhanced when we lose our hearing as we get older and so please be close to the screen. Face towards the screen or a little bit sideways like that is still okay for lip reading. Um, if you have a pre-prepared script you could put it up on your screen so you look forward your eyes are more able to watch the camera up there um, to make better eye contact. Um, be well lit on your face because that is how Zoom picks up you and a slightly darker background but preferably plain. I apologise for my bookshelf. Um, and the other thought about plainness is to not be wearing lots of colourful stuff like this because that's very much a distraction from lip reading, uh, especially uh, having earrings which bob about when you move accidentally. And um, then if the participants still can't see you properly, remind them to angle their screen if they are on a laptop or on the mobile phone because you get a better view at different angles. When you're using slides, um, RNIB recommend black on a light yellow and I see that Claire has done that for these slides. It's easier for people to read generally. Obviously keep slides simple with large letters so they can be quickly read. And um, <clears throat> say the topic first and then any other points because that helps people to realise what area of words they're listening out for and to recognise when they must have misheard something. Say how you're going to use the slides um, because then people can understand whether they're going to look at the slides for every single point or whether you're going to come back and let them read your face. Speak slower and clearly. Use your lips a little bit more than normal but not unusually so because then it's not really normal lip reading that they're practicing. They're trying to guess when you're exaggerating like this. It's very different than when you're just extra using the lips a bit. Um, articulate your consonants well, or you can sound mumbling, because it's the consonants that deaf and hard of hearing people have more difficulty with. Don't drop your voice volume or pitch at the end of a sentence or punchline. And the problem is, that gets lost then and people don't see the joke or the point. And for English, it's so, so common to drop our voice or get a bit quieter at the end. It's, it's, that is a very common habit that we do. So be aware of that. Facial expressions and gestures are very important because people are not only reading your face, but your body language. And if you've got space on the screen to use your hands, use some gestures to help give some meaning to it and give expression. So the topic, yes, I've mentioned that so people know what they're trying to hear out, listen out for. Equipment, if your internet is unstable, you could try using an ethernet cable. I don't know if you've done that before. Um, I'm going to unplug mine now so I can show you what it looks like. And this goes direct into the router from my laptop. It didn't make any difference today, but it has at other times. You can also decrease the input to your computer so to try and decrease the load on the Wi-Fi and make sure nobody else in the house is using the Wi-Fi so that um, there's less load on it. <coughs> try and avoid background noise, please, because fan heater, radio, children, workmen, very distracting and uh, somebody hard of hearing doesn't really know where the sound's coming from, whether it's coming from their house. So I went to answer the front doorbell the other day and it wasn't mine, it was online. <laughs> so um, that's worth knowing. Make sure you know where to adjust your microphone loudness and make sure that the audience knows or if they can do to find out where they can adjust the volume. I must say I've found having um, 
Bluetooth speakers much easier to manage for volume so I can adjust the volume on the Bluetooth speakers. I don't have to open up the bottom right hand corner of my screen to adjust my volume. Um, being be aware of how far away from the microphone you are and try to stay a constant distance because if you're over here looking for some papers for a moment or looking down at the floor in case something's dropped you will be lost um, so the constant distance from the microphone helps um, and it avoids distortion as well because if further you are away from the microphone the more distorted you feel you sound um, so I've got a 20 quid Bluetooth loudspeaker, which is um, small and very, very useful. You can use live captions. So uh, I found the live captions on here on the Zoom very different to Google Meet. Google Meet are bottom center all the time, so they're not obstructing the screen and the accuracy varies quite a bit. So the Google Meet accuracy is really good, well above 90%, maybe 95%. But the main point about communication online, I think, is, is to ensure that people are able to say to you, can't hear, or, or make suggestions to you to try to improve their experience of uh, participating and ask them uh, if they can give you ideas about how to um, improve your communication or what's difficult for them. Hope that's helped. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, yes, some some really good tips there. Um, I definitely need to to pick up on some of those. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to run through um, some top tips that we've been sent through from the Thomas Pocklington Trust. Um, they couldn't be with us today, but they have sent these through to us. And um, just so you know, you don't have to make uh, notes throughout this whole thing. We, we will send these out to you because I realise there's quite a lot of information today. And um, so you'll be able to use these afterwards. Um, OK, so some top tips on sight loss then. Um, so the first one is, um, yeah, I think this has been mentioned already today, but just kind of offering to send out slides for people or other visual information um, before the meeting or before the activity, um, just because screen share um, isn't necessarily compatible for, for people with uh, screen, re sorry, for screen readers. Um, so, so that could be a good tip. Um, the second one is um, remembering that the chat box isn't necessarily accessible for people with sight loss. So making sure that you're offering different uh, options for people. Um, also remembering uh, to explain activities verbally and not assuming that everyone can see what you're doing. Um, and, and I think this is, this is particularly um, important for people with sight loss who, who, who might have um, difficulties with that. Um, and also having the option of people to join by phone, um, as some people with sight loss um, won't want to do activities online uh, for, for, these, for these reasons explained already. So um, having those different options is, is really good. Um, okay, so we do have um, a few minutes for Q&A. Um, and we, as I say, we'll be sending out the details of um, everything that we've talked about today and also contact details for all of the speakers. So if there is something that someone's mentioned and you want to, to follow up with them, uh, then you can do that. Um, so I'm just going to change my view because I can't see everyone. Um, but did anyone have any questions immediately that they wanted to ask the, the presenters? realize that we've had quite a lot of information uh, thrown at you today so uh, don't worry if you don't have any immediate questions but if you do um i can see someone's hand up kevin johnson did you want to unmute yourself hi um Hello. sorry one simple thing i could just share with the previous speaker harriet um it, when presenting it's really important I guess to be conscious of the name banner at the bottom of the screen and how that could impact on on uh, being able to observe uh, the mouth um, there were a number of occasions what I noticed there was a, 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 the ba a banner ob obliterated her voice her face um, and 
It was just a, a small thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> small thing, but we've got a very long banner. <laughs> just, yeah, so that was it. Thanks. No, that's a really good point. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Emma, I think I can see your hand up. Hi, yeah, yeah that was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Emma from, from Goldie's. We've been doing uh, more pre-recorded stuff that people can access and singing sessions. So it's been nice to hear some of the feedback. Um, Sophia, in particular, I was interested in, you were talking about being able to phone in or making a conference call uh, that where you can ring out and, and get people involved with Zoom over the telephone. It's just something that I've tried to get my head around. <laughs> Have you got a resource or something that you could point me in the right direction for? Because it's where we're kind of moving on to now. <clears throat> um, really, I would just say um, Google what sort of phone you have and conference call feature. Um, yeah, there's ups and downs with it. So if you conference call several people, not every smartphone lets you mute them individually. Um, so for example, if I dial somebody into my Zoom call, I can hear her singing throughout. I can put myself on mute for her. But if we had two people on the line, they would be able to hear each other and there'd be a time delay. So it's not a perfect um, system for getting people on, but it does mean for one or two people who wouldn't be able to access it at all, at least they're able to join in that way and they uh, tend to bow out the songs and don't care too much anyway. <laughs> so it's not just a matter of that, that that they can hear you, they can actually get involved through the phone? Yeah, so they'll come up as a screen on Zoom, so you can mute them and unmute them for everybody else. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, they'll come up as your telephone number, um, and if you have multiple people, it will come up as one, one screen. Um, but it does mean that there's no interference for everybody else, and they can hear the singing leader, so they can sit at home and they can have their sing without... Um, it being disturbed in any way by feedback or yeah. Does that answer your question Emma? Yeah that does thank you yeah I just need to do more research but that's great <laughs> thank you yeah. Brilliant okay any further questions? Oh Kevin again go for it you're on mute again. Yeah I don't mean to have, uh, hog this I wanted to ask Pete when you were speaking when you were talking about co-hosting the Zoom meeting, did the yeah. co-host need to be in the same same room, same venue, um, and uh, could the co-host manage the, the, the meeting as well as the host? Yeah, so that on Zoom, um, the majority of controls, if you make somebody a co-host, are then controllable either as a co-host uh, sorry, as a host or a co-host. Yeah. Um, uh, you you will but obviously both need to be within the same um, Zoom meeting for that to, to work. And what I forgot to mention earlier is if the host's internet connection should drop out, it does mean that then that call will continue rather than potentially dropping if you are the only host on a call. So it could potentially finish the call for everybody if you were the only host in that situation so it, it really is worth having a co-host if you can on calls that's really helpful thank you welcome brilliant thank you and any more questions oh hattie go for it um just to say that out of um people classified as blind uh, about four percent of people cannot see any light or dark and um, so there's a, a tremendous gradation between what people can and can't see. So it's interesting to realise that I suppose it's the same with hard of hearing, but it's a, a, a gradation about what they can and can't see. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, OK, any further questions? Oh, Bianca. Hi, um, I'm Bianca, I'm at BAB. Um, a question for Hattie or anyone else um, who might have knowledge in this area. I was wondering what, um, for 
deaf people whose um, primary language is British Sign Language, whether there are advantages to actually having a BSL interpreter in a meeting over the closed captions. I know there's also advantages for closed captions, um, especially um, actually for for lots of people, um, including people with sort of learning differences who find it easier to read. But I wondered, I get the impression I'm having a look at the captions we've got today, which I think are AI. They're very impressive. But no, it's a real person. Delay. Oh, it is. They're very good. Um, but there's there's a bit of a delay. I wonder if there's less delay with BSL and also whether BSL perhaps picks up a bit more on, on nuance and tone. Um, so for things that are about social participation, whether there's a benefit for people who mainly speak BSL to have an interpreter instead of captions? Good question. Okay, I mean, BSL is a language in its own right. And if you've never heard English, you don't know how it sounds. And the majority of people doing BSL don't read it. Don't read English. That's very unusual to find a, a full BSL D capital D deaf person um, being able to read English. Um, so most people who read English and do sign language have had some hearing at a younger age and have learned a bit about how language sounds before they've lost their hearing. So that's the kind of group that can read it or might be able to read it. So I guess it's I... Oh. Sorry, it's Suzanne. Um, I can't type and speak at the same time. But um, Bianca, I might just put something in there, and it's that it, it could be a cost consideration. Getting someone to do BSL is extremely expensive. Um, and as Hati said, it only serves very few people, which is really people who've learned BSL from young. The vast, vast majority of people with hearing loss are people who've lost their hearing later in life, and they don't tend to learn BSL. Mm. I just, sorry, I couldn't Thank type. you. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> Um, Thank no, you, that's really, really helpful. And I guess it really just comes back to knowing who your audience is and uh, preparing, doesn't it, uh, for which is the most appropriate. Um, okay, any further questions before we close today? Um, great. Oh, Hattie. I guess it might be beneficial to just Google and find out what activities there are for BSL users because they can feel quite left out. Yeah, no, very true, very true. It's um, it's always good to know what's out there, doesn't it, for, for different uh, different uh, tastes and and uh, and experiences. So, um, okay, so I want to say a massive thank you to our speakers today. Um, it's been a really informative session um, for me as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for um, taking the time uh, to prepare that today. Um, and um, as mentioned, we'll be sharing the slides with you all afterwards and we'll be sharing um, uh, contact details. Um, so if you've got any further questions you want to ask um, any of the speakers or the um, Bristol Age and Better team, then please do uh, come through to us. Um, and lastly, a massive thank you to everyone uh, for coming along, our virtual audience, uh, and for engaging with the topic. Um, I hope you have found it really useful, um, and I hope to see you at uh, future BAB events. So thanks very much. <laughs>